image that you see here is uh, an image of Mar St. Martin de Porres. Oh, my Spanish isn't very good, sorry. Um, and uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about the context into which he was born before I speak in, about his life directly. The most important piece of context here is about the history of Spanish colonialism. Um, so, you know, this is not exactly the most pleasant stuff here, I have to admit. A couple of things to note. Uh, the first of them is about the Rey, what's known as the Rey Conquista. This is the final expulsion of uh, Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula that was accomplished in the year 1492, also the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, all that stuff. Um, essentially, uh, in a decree called the Alhambra Decree, um, Ferdinand and Isabella, the kings, king and queen of Spain at the time, expelled, said either, if, if you're Jewish or Muslim, you either have to convert or leave the country. It's a very heavy-handed approach, let's say that, at least. Indeed, I would go so far as to say that it's probably an inappropriate approach to evangelization, <laughs> certainly in the 21st century. Um, but this had legitimacy at, at the time because of a practice in the church known as the Patronato Real, which is the right of royal patronage. According to this practice, the Pope, here's like one of the popes that was around at the time of Ferdinand and Isabella, um, gave, granted to the kings and queens of Spain, this is Ferdinand and Isabella, an image of them, um, the right to act in the name of the Pope, essentially, in mission territories that they encountered in their role as king and queen of, of Spain. Um, so ideally, that meant that they were also in charge of any efforts of evangelization that took place in Spanish colonies. It's a complicated system that it really enmeshes the temporal interests of these kings and queens with the spiritual interests of the church in a way that's, frankly, very dangerous. <laughs> um, another example of that sort of mixing is also from this same period, and it's worth re referencing because of Martin's unique uh, ethnic heritage here as well. So I have to men mention then also another pope named Nicholas V. Um, this confusion in this ca in his case meant um, a sort of confounding of what a true evangelization looks like in the colonial world. So Nicholas V um, argued in a, a letter to Alfonso I, who was the, the, a king of Portugal at the time, in a papal bull called Romanus Pontifex. That's Alfonso I there. Uh, it's from the year 1455. Uh, I'm going to summarize the text, but there are a number of quotations that I'm taking from the text and what I'm about to say. He says to this king of Portugal in, the, in 1455 that in order to restrain the savage excesses of all Saracens, that is Muslims, and pagans, that it requires a, of them a perpetual slavery, which is a most pious and noble work whereby the salvation of souls and increase of the faith are promoted. That's a pretty stark claim. Let me shorten that up a little bit. In other words, Nicholas V, the, the Pope, is arguing that slavery serves evangelization because these particular people's salvation essentially requires that slavery reign in the vices that they have. In other words, these people are vicious people and only slavery can bring them close to Christianity. It's a disturbing claim, um, but it's it's proximate to, if you watch my video on Josephine Bakita, um, it's proximate to something known as the Curse of Ham in the ancient, uh, ancient well, no, really, early modern world. Uh, I'm not going to say much more about it here, but let's suffice for the moment that the, uh, someone of even partial African descent, like Martin de Porres was, um, he uh, is going to encounter like significant disadvantages in a system like this, since they were believed, according to even like 
someone like Nicholas V to be inclined to what he calls savage, savage excesses and vices, essentially. Um, Martin himself is born in 1579 in Lima, Peru. You'll see there uh, in, on the map there. This is during Spanish, the Spanish colonial period. He was the son of Ana Velasquez, uh, who was a freed slave of African and perhaps indigenous descent, and Don Juan de Porres, uh, a Spanish nobleman who exploited Ana and abandoned her, Martin, and his sister, jo Juana. Mm, sorry. Throughout his life, um, because of the, what I've just outlined here, Martin experienced some pretty serious racial discrimination and suffered other social consequences from being considered illegitimate because his father abandoned him. Um, within the church, he was barred from full membership in the Peruvian Catholic religious orders uh, because he was mixed race. From his youth, he had an intense and pious prayer life, right? Commendably to him, despite these disadvantages that he encountered. Uh, and he also was, uh, many uh, miracles were attributed to his intervention. Uh, he volunteered as a layman uh, in a number of communities, including the Holy Rosary Dominicans, the order that he eventually uh, joined, as much as he could at least, and was accepted as a third order uh, of that order in his, that means a lay member uh, in his later life here. He had some training in medical arts um, and got involved in the community's infirmary, their sort of hospital. Uh, and there's one uh, particular incident that's worth mentioning here. He was he was known for his universal charity toward all the members of the community, all the way from the noblemen up down to the slaves. But during one plague in that community, the hospital wing was sequestered because they didn't want the disease to spread. And Martin was known to sort of ma like miraculously even pass through the doors. This is part of that monastery right here. Pass through the doors uh, into that wing of the monastery and uh, minister to the sick that were present in there. Uh, he was reprimanded by his superior not to do this, but he kept doing it and was eventually... Uh, uh, he, he, he replied to his superior at that point, Forgive my error, and please instruct me, for I did not know that the precept of obedience took precedence over that of charity. <laughs> right? So it's kind of a zinger. Uh, and he was allowed to continue his ministries as he saw fit from that point forward. Uh, he served in this capacity then for uh, uh, maybe as much as 20 years, and he died of illness in 1639. That's uh, an image here of his uh, grave site, uh, I believe, uh, even today. So what do we learn about, what can we learn from Martin's life? Um, we have pains in our lives, but other people have pains in their lives as well. Sufferings, hurts, wounds, we could even say, right? Uh, Martin went out of his way to try to figure out what he could do to help heal the pains and the sufferings of the peoples that he saw around himself. They need our prayers but they also need our concrete acts of charity. Uh, even if we can't heal miraculously like Martin, there are things that we can do to go find, identify, and heal the wounds in the world around us. In the image that we have prepared uh, from our artist Aaron Wee has prepared for us, uh, you'll see a number of symbols here. Uh, the first of them is a cross. Now, I think of this in terms of the history of salvation, and so another image of healing from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, was a moment where Moses raises up a serpent, a staff in the desert, um, that was understood by Christians in the New Testament as a, a sign or a foreshadowing of Christ's cross, right? The true source of all healing in the world. Um, just as Moses raised up the serpent, in order to heal the ancient Israelites, so Jesus was raised up on the cross in order to heal all human beings throughout all of human history. Um, and so Martin draws his healing strength from Christ's strength, and that's what that uh, image symbolizes. We also see uh, him wearing his Dominican robes, 
Uh, he was allowed to wear the robes in his lifetime. Um, and this is then obviously also a sign of his uh, Marian devotion because he was, as I said, a member of the Dominican Dominicans of the Holy Rosary. Uh, there's a number of books that I'll leave us with, right, that uh, are, have been written about Martin's life, but I'll, I only have a couple here. Uh, this one is a, a child's, a children's text. And then uh, another one here has not just biographical details, but also um, a number of prayers, I believe, uh, right, and devotions uh, to uh, St. Martin. So perhaps that would be a good place to start our own devotions to this wonderful saint of our tradition.